every single bow is unique in its own way because every single set of horns comes with its own unique set of problems. And you can't tell that until you open them up. Close will work, but close ain't good enough. If it ain't right, it ain't right. You know, when I way back 40 years ago when I was going to do this, I, I was going to be smart and go to the library and get a how-to book. Well, there weren't no such thing as a how-to book. You kind of have to think back about to the 1800s. The Native Americans, the way they had lived was, was so turned upside down, there was no more need for the bow. You know, in, in the early 1900s, 1910s, 20s, and whatnot, uh, the Native Americans learned that uh, they can make some of this stuff as tourist material. But that, that it didn't have the quality that the old bows were. And, and so that, that information just went away. As, as, you know, by the time I come along, it, it, was, it was long gone. They, they didn't, nobody had a clue on how to make a horn bow. I think it's important um, just because um, before he figured it all out, I think it was pretty much a lost art. You know, I don't, I don't plan on being a, a, a bow maker like he is. This is just, I've always wanted to build one with his supervision just because I want one. And, and maybe someday I might even hunt with it a little bit. You've got, you've got all of this right down in here. All of that's got to come out of there. You see there? I've, I've cut that. And, I, and yes, I used a bandsaw to cut it with. Now, if I was like the old natives, I would have used, utilized the hot springs. I would have softened it up, and I would have carved it with whatever I had, whether it be a stone tool or whatever. And you got to have both horns to make the bow, and you got to cut the back off, and then, of course, you're going to work it down. Sometimes that means riding hell for leather, but you got to ride, you know. I, I don't want them horns that are broomed way back. What I call trophy horns, trophy heads, they're, they're no good for bows. You can't see it from the outside, but when you cut them open, they have real severe cracks in the horn structure. And I don't mean hairline cracks. I mean cracks that are uh, anywhere from an eighth to an, uh, three sixteenths. And sometimes you'll open up a set of horns, and they'll be absolutely perfect. Other times they have imperfections in there that you have to deal with, and and you never know until you get there what you what you got, and and then you figure out how you're going to deal with it. Uh, anyone want an ice cream sandwich? Sure. And that set that's on the stove right now, I put them in Sunday evening, and they have been there. This will be the fourth day consecutively non-stop uh, they're, they're in that hot water 24 7 and when you put that horn in that water they're soft enough they're, they're just like your fingernails you can whittle on them with a sharp piece of obsidian uh you can abrade them with a piece of a, a, a you know coarse sandstone uh that kind of stuff the native americans would have utilized especially the hot springs in yellowstone park because that was a sacred place for them but the thing was they would have had to have been very careful because if you if you get one that's too hot It'll melt the horn instead of just soften it. When he's out there on that mountainside all by himself, you better stay on him. If you come off, you better not let go of them reins because it's a long walk home. The horn bow is extremely fast. I don't know of a single old-fashioned wooden bow that will even come close to that kind of speed. The, the, the thing of it is, if you're shooting a bow that that will shoot at 200 foot per second, there, there's no way you're going to get out of the way of that arrow. I actually felt like I might could stand back and, and, and catch an arrow off a wooden bow. But when we shot the horn bow, I knew darn good and well I didn't want to be anywhere near in front of that thing because the only thing you were going to catch was an arrow stuck in your body. You weren't going to catch it in your hand, I'll guarantee you. See, I don't think that's going to go down any. No, 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 we'll have to work it out. But, but it was from my granddad, I learned how to use my two hands, how to make anything and everything I wanted to make. And and, and I still enjoy the challenge because every bow is, a, is another set of problems. Every little thing I do is, is uh, 
It's got its own unique challenges, and I'm a man that loves a challenge. And I never had any intentions of being a bowyer. I just wanted to see if I could make a horn bow. But then one leads to two, and then two leads to three, and then somebody wants to buy one, and then somebody wants to buy the next one, and the next one, and you got to pay the bills. So I've now made over 40 of these things. Unfortunately for me, it got out of hand. Perfect. Uh, all right. I learned the very hard way, uh, don't never dry fire a bow, whether it be a wooden bow and or a horn bow, because they'll break, they'll blow up and break. And so I have had a wooden bow blow up and hurt me. I mean, it when it, when it exploded, I thought it broke my hand, it hurt so bad. I've never had a horn bow. Well, yeah, I take that back by Jinx. My second horn bow that I was dry firing, when that thing exploded, it hit me right between the eyes, and blood's running down my face. Snapped in two and whopped him right between the eyes and split his head open. Um, <laughs> that was kind of interesting. Uh, I'm lucky I didn't lose an eye with that one. But, uh, yeah, so don't, don't never dry fire any bow. But, uh, yeah, that one blew up and really smacked me good. See that daylight between them? Uh-huh. So that's what I'm looking for, is to see where. So... I would hope that sometimes you get it thin enough you can actually, when I put the, vi the clamp on it, I can almost, I can clamp it down. When uh, you get ready to put the horns together, you have to make your own hide glue. I like to take a piece of elk hide, but you can use anything. In other words, you can use mountain sheep, you can use deer, you can use buffalo, your elk hide, your buffalo hide, and even a, a cow hide or or. or substantially thicker and so you can take a piece about oh 10 12 inches in diameter and get all you want and when you put it in the water and start boiling it it just dissolves it just melts right down and the first time i ever did it i wondered how do i know when i have glue well uh, as it got boiled down and and the hide got less and less i finally got brave enough and stuck my finger in there very carefully because it's hot and it come out sticky. So I, I learned that about the consistency of carol syrup or liquid honey, and you've got your glue. That, that scum, that film, and we're gonna have to pour that off uh, at, least, at least three times. And because it's, it's not gonna take eight, 10, 12 hours. Uh, we may not have uh, hide glue until tomorrow. It's nothing but protein. Your horns protein, and so they're very compatible, and they work very well together. Everybody's always saying that you can't take these bows out and, and like it was raining. Yeah. Well, that's a bunch of nonsense, let me tell you. You have to remember one thing. The horn by itself will not hold up. If, if you try to make a horn bow with just the horn alone, it would crystallize and break. It would not hold very long, and it would not make that strong of a bow. When, when you add the sinew to the bow, that is what produces your draw weight, and that's also what produces the speed. Well, sinew comes uh, in all, all parts of the body. Uh, whether you be a human being or an animal, uh, as a, for example, you talk about the basketball player or the football player tearing up his Achilles tendon. Well, that's the one in the heel. Uh, I don't like that tendon. Uh, a lot of a lot of these boyers and whatnot, they like it, but I don't. It's short. It's hard to work. I prefer to take the sinew right out of the back. Right there's a strip on each side of the backbone, and I prefer to cut that out in the fall of the year when I go hunting. And I clean it very thoroughly, scrape all the meat and fat off, wash it real good, and dry it. And then I put it away, and that's what I use to send you back my bows. And also to wrap them, wrap the handles, wrap the ends. Uh, that, that's the send you I prefer. The boss doesn't expect him to come back with a fistful of excuses. He expects you to come back with the job done. That carries over to every facet of your life. Tillering the bow is one of the slowest, most painstaking parts of, of the whole process. Yeah. Tillering is just simply balancing 
the bow limbs, getting them to where they'll both bend evenly. And invariably, no matter how careful you are, one side will be bending more than the other. Well, the side that's not bending as much has to be filed down, scraped down, worked down until it's even with the other side. And this process can take a very long time. The thing of it is, if you get in a big hurry in the tillering process and you try to take a whole bunch off, then what's going to happen is you're going to take too much off. And so then you're going to be on the other side trying to get it to even up. And if you do that often enough, jumping back and forth, pretty soon you've ruined your bow. So I say you tiller a little bit and shoot your bow a lot. Give that sinew a chance to work, a chance to catch up. All right, now I always make sure I get hooked over my foot and, and get a good hold here. Oh, man. Ugh. I'll, I'll warm it up. I'll string it up. And I never pull it to full draw. I'll, I'll take that bow out and I'll shoot it in half draw until it kind of warms up, loosens up. And then eventually I'll take it all the way to full draw. But you have to give it a little consideration if it hasn't been shot for quite a while. Otherwise, you might also break or damage your bow. You also have to learn how to shoot it, how to handle it, the do's and the don'ts. Uh, because one wrong mistake, uh, like stringing it backwards, will break it. Uh, not unstringing it will destroy it. In other words, you can string it up and go all day. That's fine. But in the evening time, you better unstring it and let that sinew go back to a relaxed position. If you don't, it's like taking a rubber band and putting it around a big bundle of mail and leaving it indefinitely. It destroys the rubber band. Well, that's what happens to the sinew. If you do not unstring that bow and let it go back into a relaxed position, you will destroy the sinew. Ah, boy, I sure did that, right? <laughs> yeah, I kind of relive the past a little while I'm moving into the future, which I don't like too much, but I'm, I'm just probably as nostalgic as a lot of other people. And I, I just happen to have one advantage, and that is I, I, I got to live out all my dreams. And growing up, I, I had to be a cowboy, and I've been out in them hills. I've been cold. I've been hot. I've been froze. And yet I've had the joy and the, and the satisfaction of making these things. Without the past, where would I be?